Marty Douglas. I was born September 10, 1946, Sioux City, Iowa. The, the Vietnam issue was something that was kind of a, it was kind of abstract to me. I mean, I was a kid in school, you know, with a paper out. And uh, then towards the end of school, but about the time I was getting out of school, uh, they were, uh, Vietnam was escalating a little bit, not a lot. Uh, I thought it was always the Marines over there. And I had a girlfriend at that time, and her dad says, you're going to Vietnam. I said, oh no, it's only the Marines that go to Vietnam. I'm not going to Vietnam. And uh, I got my draft notice, and he says, you're going to Vietnam. <laughs> and I was working daytime at a, a Ford dealership in West Des Moines, grease monkey mechanic type thing. And uh, I had a girlfriend, I had buddies. Uh, I had an apartment, I was free. I, I, it was a good time in life, you know. And uh, then one day I got an envelope and it was, it was my draft notice. Uh, I didn't really know what it was, but I had a good idea of what it was. And it kind of ruined Thanksgiving that year in 1965 for the family. Just turned 19 in September. And I got this thing probably the end of October. So then I was to report down to Fort Des Moines I think it was December 28th, and uh, I spent the entire day down there. We got sworn in. Then they took us over to the airport. We got on a plane, and we flew to Kansas City. They picked us up by bus, and they took us to uh, Fort Leonard Wood. I was drafted into an infantry battalion, and everybody's MOS at that time was infantry. Uh, after basic training, they needed members from the A, B, and C company, the line companies, to fill headquarters companies. So they selected certain people out of the headquarters company, or out of the line companies to fill headquarters. I was taken in that allotment and assigned to a four deuce mortar platoon. In, in headquarters company, we had the truck drivers, we had the motor pool, we had commo, we had uh, cooks, uh, medics. Uh, every trade that makes up a, a battalion we had in there. And the neat thing about being in headquarters is it's like a big family, you get to know everybody. And it's a real diverse population, you know. It's, and, and that helped out a lot when I went to Vietnam because when we went to Vietnam, we went as a battalion. So everybody that had trained together went together, and we were assigned the same place. In, in training, I was very fortunate. We had a CO that was uh, a Vietnam veteran, which that's pretty unusual because Vietnam was pretty much in its infancy back then. And uh, Captain Cavanaugh wanted all of his troops to be infantry troops. So cooks, medics, everybody trained as a line company. We had, we had real good training. Captain Cavanaugh probably saved a lot of lives with his training. Th those troop carriers, they're not nice. Uh, they're crowded, the food's terrible. Uh, the cots, they, they stack them five high in a uh, area that probably only has a seven or eight foot ceiling. I mean, Literally, they're, they're that, the bunks are that far apart. When one guy rolls over, the guy above him is jostled by it. I mean, it's just that way. So many of the people got dysentery on that ship that any time that you went in there to use the, the head, you'd always leave a space between you and the next guy. And that's so you could set your butt on one stool and stick your head in the one next to it because it was coming out both ends. And, uh, of course, the water was sloshing, and, and it, it was terrible. It really was. We couldn't wait to get to Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam, when you first get there, we were out to sea, so we were used to that salt air, you know, and, and up in Washington State, salt air. And down there in Vung Tau Harbor, you smelled this kind of a sweet decay, a uh, lot of wood smoke. Um, it's just a, just a different environment. Wood fires everywhere, that's how they cooked. 
But, but, but the first night that we were there on land, you could see all these flares going, flying, and, and hear the artillery and small arms fire. And, and, and Vung Tau was a safe place, but still all that stuff was going on, you know. And, uh, you know, oh man, you know, this, I don't want to get off the ship. We are torn between wanting to get off the ship and wanting to get on land. And, uh, we got off the ship and they, they drove us by convoy to Bearcat. Uh, it's it's uh, probably a battalion sized area, uh, south and east of Saigon, I believe. I never knew where I was in, in Vietnam the whole time, but uh, I think it was south and east of Saigon. We were just starting to get into the monsoons. It wasn't, it wasn't raining hard every day, but we'd get some downpours. And whenever it'd start raining, everybody would take off their clothes and grab their soap and go outside and shower up, you know, get lathered up. You get lathered up about that time and quit raining. So there you were covered with soap. So we'd string the tent flaps to where they'd catch water. And then we could, you know, take that water and rinse off. And that was always warm water because it's always in the sun and, you know, nice warm water. When we got there, the monsoons were just coming about in full force. And we were sleeping in shelter halves. And, I mean, it was raining so bad you couldn't see 20 foot away. It was just pouring. And it was pretty miserable. And we had to dig mortar pits because that's where we were going to be. The mortar pits are about, oh, they're probably about 18 inches or two foot deep and then you put sandbags around that to raise it up another couple foot and the the base plate of the mortar uh, it, it's it's a big heavy base plate made over at Maytag by the way in Newton Iowa and uh, when you fire the gun the, the, the gun wants to kick back and We'd bury those base plates in mud. We'd have to get the three-quarter ton trucks and hook chains onto them to pull them out. And of course, after you fire, you have to set them, reset them up and recalibrate your sights. So, I mean, it was a fight, you know, sometimes when we were doing that. And with the help of some TSP from the engineers, we finally figured out a way to keep them from sliding. And so then, then fire missions were pretty good. Everything we had was so old. Even our sea rations were older than I was. We, uh, we were in a supply tent one time down in Bearcat, and we found a box of, there were cans of hamburgers. The cans were about this tall and about that big around. They were packed in lard. And those things were from 1942, and we stole them and ate them. <laughs> the heat and humidity was just oppressive at at, Bear, or at Dong Tam. We were away from the water, we are inland, and uh, it was on the Michelin rubber plantation. And the, the good thing about that was Michelin taxed any damage to their trees. If we destroyed any of their trees, we had to pay for them. If the Viet Cong destroyed any of their trees, they had to pay for them. So we never got incoming mortar rounds while I was there, um, which made it a, a somewhat safe place. Uh, the bad things um, was that uh, we never got much of a breeze either. It was always stifling in there. We'd be on, because we fired at night, uh, during the day we'd have to pull perimeter guard and we'd be out there sitting on top of the bunkers and we had to wear a helmet and a flak jacket. Well, it was so hot out there, everybody just stripped down to their waist and sit out there, you know. And we used to fire at night. We'd fire uh, illumination and high explosive and all that. And one night we were firing and, and we don't know what happened. Uh, anyway, it, it just didn't fire. You know, you got hang fires and misfires. And, all that. So anyway, we, we shut. First of all, we tried to get the round out. Now, mortar doesn't have a breech, so what you have to do is you got to tip the tube upside down and let the round come sliding out. Somebody's got to put his fingers down there and catch it. And you, you want to just have your fingers and thumb at the edge to catch it so in case it 
comes out and fire, explosion, whatever, you don't lose your whole hand. And we went through all the protocols to get that round out of there. Nothing happened. We, we couldn't get it out. Wassel, now he was the biggest, strongest guy in the platoon. He had that tube upside down. He's banging it on the ground trying to get that round to slide out. Nothing happened. So we shut the gun down and we went and fired off one of the other guns for the rest of the night. And uh, the next morning, the first sergeant called us out and uh, he said, mortar platoon, need a detail. Get over here and pick up this round. Well, the round had left the tube. We didn't know it, it had left the tube and gone probably, I don't know, 150, 200 feet maybe and landed over by the first sergeant's tent. Now, I mean, if you're gonna target somebody, who better to target than the first sergeant? But uh, anyway, uh, they, they have to arm. They got blocks that open up, and for whatever reason, that thing didn't spin enough to arm, so it didn't didn't explode. You know, but that was our first experience with a short round, and uh, we got that taken care of. We, we kind of went back and forth between being extremely busy and being extremely bored. When there wasn't anything to do, it was so boring and the tedium. And uh, that's when people got into trouble, um, just mischief. And there was a lot of drinking. I mean, we were young and we were in a combat zone. What the heck, you know? And, and we didn't have television. So there wasn't much to do except drink and crowds and carry on. And partway through the rotations, they didn't want the divisions and the battalions and the companies and everything leaving Vietnam at once. So what they started doing is rotating people from other divisions, battalions and companies in and it was a trade-off of people so that the, the ETS date, the going home date, was different and that way all the units stayed functioning and fully manned. So what they did with me is they sent me down to the 9th Division, and that was uh, down in the Mekong Delta. So I kind of went from base camp warrior to line warrior overnight, you know. And all my Captain Cavanaugh's training back in the States come in pretty valuable, you know. It, it uh, at least let me know what I was expected to do out there in the line. I don't think I was in base camp more than three weeks, the rest of the time I was out in the field. And I liked it, I, I really liked being in the field. Didn't like being shot at, and didn't like shooting people, but I, I really enjoyed being out in the boonies. So I mean, you, you amass that many people together, and there's bound to be some casualties, some deaths, some miracles, yeah. When I was up in Four Deuce, when we first got to Dow Jin, we were firing spotter rounds for H&Is. They wanted to set up H&I locations. And there was this uh, laterite hill, it was this huge thing. And we climbed to the top of it so we could see where the rounds were going. And the, the FO and the RTO and the driver, they stayed with the Jeep down behind us. And we were up there and they fired a couple of rounds and pretty soon they fired another round. We heard this whoosh, whoosh, and there was somebody with us that had more experience in country than, than me and, and Ben. And he said, oh shit, and he got down in the foxhole. So we followed him. And that round landed behind us. And it landed somewhere between us and the, the Jeep out there. Now the Jeep had a, an FO and an RTO standing in front of it, looking at a map that was spread out on the hood. And it had a driver sitting inside the Jeep. That round blew out the radiator and all four tires, and nobody got a scratch. So that's how miracles work. One time we were out on a, a, a night patrol, and we had been working all day, and they sent us out that night, platoon, and we got to an area. We could look down the road, and we saw this Arvin Fort down there, and where we were was kind of a clearing, but there were some trees around, and there were some termite mountains there. And it was night, we'd been walking for a while. So they said, okay, take 20 or whatever. So we all split off into our little individual groups and two men awake, one man sleep. 
Well, we woke up a little bit later after all three of us had been sleeping. And there were three of us out there, Jim Forrest, me, and Rich Sampson. Everybody else was gone. We had no idea where they went. They were just gone. So now what do you do? Do you, do you walk to the French fort at night in the dark? No, we didn't think that was a good idea. We could walk back the way we came, but we didn't think that was a good idea either. So I said, well, let's just stay here till daylight. Maybe they'll send somebody to look for us or we figure out where we're going. So that's what we did. We just stayed there. And pretty soon we heard movement, we heard a lot of people coming. And so we real quiet, you know, looking around. Hey, I think them are our guys. And they were coming, our guys were coming back the same way they'd gone out, going back to base camp. So we let them get down the road about 100 feet. Then we just followed in with them and we just gradually closed the gap. And except for Jim Forrest, Rich Sampson, and me, I'm sure nobody in the platoon knew that we had gotten separated that night 